go. It's just under more now. <clears throat> okay, record. Um, and one announcement before we get started. Next week, for those of you who will be in Rockport, either on the screen or here in person, right after um, Bible study, we're going to go over to um, Lisa and John Paul's new house, and we are going to bless the house and share communion. So, um, and um, so I will send out a reminder. Um, the house is, you know, about four minutes from here, so there's no excuse. <laughs> I, I thought it was so cool to, to think about doing that, to, you know, as for a blessing on the house as they moved in. So those of you who can be here, we look forward to it. Okay, so we are on um, the study of Matthew, week 13, chapter 13. <clears throat> And last week, um, where we left off, remember there are five sections in Matthew. We're at the end of section three, which is chapters 11 through 13, where Matthew is telling us about people's reaction to Jesus. Some believe in what, that he's the Messiah, some question whether he's the Messiah, and some out and out do not believe he's the Messiah. And each of these five sections, after they give exam Matthew gives examples, it ends in a teaching um, by Jesus. The teaching in, in this third section is about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and it's done in parables. And before we get started, we left off on chapter 13, verse 24. Do you want to say something about parables? Well, yeah, you know, I, there, I will say one thing. Parables are a way of teaching uh, that's not straightforward. This is an uncommon within with rabbis. There are a lot of techniques uh, that require the, the listener, the student to actually think a little bit instead of just spoon feeding. They also tend to put things in a context that the listener understands. So a lot of his talk about sowing seeds, well, they know about sowing seeds. And, and at least one of them today talks about fishing because this is on the Galilee and a lot of those people fish. So it's designed to, to, to make it real. Once the message comes through, that association helps it become real for the person listening. But do keep in mind, if you would, there's a difference between a parable and a, a and all of a sudden analogy. Uh, not a, not an analogy, but a, a, a allegory. Oh, boy, sorry. People, an allegory. These extended things where every little item in the story is significant. It, it signifies something. I'm suspicious of allegories in general. I think the readers tend to find it because they're free to just make stuff up. But they do that with the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I have read these commentaries and, you know, the donkey represents Jerusalem and the, and they just go through and they think, no, 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 this is a story about the fact that you are the neighbor, you know, be, be the neighbor. That's what the story is about. That's what the parable is. And the fact that this Samaritan was a neighbor to the, to the man on the road where the priest and the Levite and the people, the good people pass by. And it's a lesson about being a neighbor, about, you know, who am I my brother's keeper? Well, who's my brother? Well, let me tell you, that's the story. And this, this other stuff of trying to take these parables and then read things into them is a fruitless enterprise. And we it heard just, a lot of that this week. <laughs> this week, since there's, this is full of parables, we just had to deal with that. And I've got so many of them rolling through my head. These are parables. They're, they're designed to teach a particular concept. And, I, and one other thing, too, I guess, is that a deaf concepts. You understand the word love. Greek has four different words that they use for, for love. We have one, and it's a concept. How do you describe what it is? And, and so given it a definition, like Webster, eh, it runs a little thin because people say, well, what about this? Is this philos or is this store game? And what you wind up having to do is give examples. You say, well, he, here, this, this is an example of agape. And that's a very valid way of teaching. And sometimes it's the only way of really getting a concept. That's what parables do, is they're trying to often to get across a concept that, that you can't just give a Webster 
one sentence definition up. So as we do this, keep that in mind. And please, let's try not to pick apart parables to the point that we seize up on one little word or, or you know, two or three. Uh, look at the bigger message. So the other thing last week, we started with the first parable and it was the parable of the sower. <clears throat> and Jesus was out in a boat and he was talking to hundreds of followers and then, then his disciples and he, so the 12 and he, the 12 asked, what does this parable mean? And he explained the parable in more depth to the 12. We're back, it appears now, for him talking to a bigger group. And I'm going to start at um, Matthew 13, verse 24. And it's the parable of the weeds. And I'm going to skip down to the explanation then on 36. And then we'll go up back to these. So we're going to skip some in the middle and then, and then come, come back. back. Uh -huh. So I'm on. Matthew 13, verse 24. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was asleep, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and slipped away. When the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the wheat's weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? <clears throat> Where then <clears throat> did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. So the servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he said. If you pull the weeds now, you might uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvester, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat into my barn. And now I'm going to skip down to verse 36. Then Jesus dismissed the crowds and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He replied, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are collected and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The son of man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom every cause of sin and all who practice lawlessness. And they will throw them into the fiery furnace where they will be weeping, where there will be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who hears, let him hear. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, we're going to talk about some stuff today that's probably going to hurt some people's feelings. I don't know any way around it. This is one of those times where I tell you, I can't make you believe, and I don't even try to make you believe a certain way, but we can look at what's here, and we can often understand what's here and what it's saying. And then you have the choice of saying, like they did when the bunch of people got together and Jesus talked about you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they said, this is a hard teaching. We can't follow it. And they left to the point that he even asked his 12, are you going to leave too? We all have that choice of saying, I'm just, I'm just not buying that. I'm just not going to accept that. That's, that's a choice and you get to make it. But what you can't do is look at what it actually says and say, it doesn't say that. So we're going to look at what it says. Um, it says that he's talking in a parable and he's talking about a man sowing seeds and he sows good seeds. He sows wheat. And then they begin to come up and their weeds mixed in. Well, we found out this week, actually Mary did. There's a plant and there's a, a Darnell is the English word of it. The Greek word, we, I'm not even going to try, but it, they, this plant looks like wheat until it's time to start putting on the heads and you find out it's not wheat. And then that, I mean, that's what that word means. It is a known plant. And I saw pictures of it and they literally don't know. In fact, there was Theophrastus, an ancient Greek, you know, botanist. He was one of the early ones 
said that he thought that, that sometimes wheat turns into this other thing because you think you planted wheat and it comes up and he thinks it just changes. So this is a real thing. And so the description here is the sower, which Jesus says is me, and the, the word that he plants, this gospel that he plants. Now, he talks about the kingdom of heaven a lot. If you think about Matthew has really made this a theme. We see the Sermon on the Mount where he's saying the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is here. And it's, it's me. Uh, I've, I, I'm, I'm bringing this to you, but you're a part of it. All of you ordinary people. It's not the people in Jerusalem. So that theme continues week after week. By now, some of you should have picked up on that, right? The kingdom of heaven. And so he says the kingdom of heaven is like, and here's your clue. This is the way of him giving you examples because it's a concept, because it's not something that lends itself to a Webster type definition. So the sower plants good seeds, but as they come up, there's weeds among them. <clears throat> and the people said, what's the, what's the deal? You didn't, aren't, aren't you good? Don't you plant good seeds? Where do these weeds come from? And if you don't mind, Gene, we talked about the Middle East this morning and the idea that, that you know, God is certainly not happy with this. How does he allow? I hear that often. Why would God allow this to happen? And the fact is, he doesn't show any signs of ever turning us into sock puppets. He doesn't, you know, it's a, it, the place is broken and you see our part in it, but the weeds come up. And the people say, how come you let these weeds? Didn't you plant good seed? And he says, yeah, I planted good seed. An enemy has done this. Now, remember, this is a parable for them people to see a parallel, that there is an enemy that works against this. And when they ask for an explanation, he tells them, I'm, I'm the sower. Uh, and the goods, the, the wheat are the people who are a result of the good seed. They've heard the gospel. So the others, they're the children of the, the, the enemy. Says the devil. Yeah. And, and so, you know, this can't be much clearer. You see what's going on. But let me tell you, I'll, I'll give you, and, and the problem is they then say, well, do you want us to go weed them out? Let's go get, there's your Middle East. Yeah, Larry, you got the, that's exactly <laughs> right. I mean, do you want us to go wipe out all the bad seed? We can, we can cure this for you. There's a point where, where James and John, uh, there's a town that has, you know, rejected them. And they ask Jesus, well, do you want us to call down fire from heaven on them? Do you want us to, you know, I mean, we got this, this power going. Do you want us to do that? No, I don't think any fire and brimstone is going to be necessary today. Do you want us to go pull up the weeds? <laughs> and he says, no, because to do that, you'd wind up damaging the wheat also. Let me make this in another way. Within churches, within the kind of church that we think of that is a building, um, there are people that go to church for, I don't know why sometimes. I was in, we were members of a church and, and there was a leader and I'm not gonna say what they called the leader because that would tell you the denomination. But he's one of the big leaders, you know, that, that gets set aside. And I was talking to him about something and he goes, whoa, hold on, stop, hold it. And he says, I'm just going to tell you, I don't believe any of this. I said, what? <laughs> he says, I don't believe any of this. He says, I think, you know, going to church makes us better people. It, it, you know, but he says, I'm, I don't believe any of this stuff. And that sort of puts, puts a crimp in the conversation. But he's one of the leaders. He's one of the people that is, that is, you know, ordained kind of thing, right? I don't believe any of it. That, to me, is about as clear of an example of wheat and tares or wheat and, and darnell as you can think of. They're sort of indistinguishable. If I didn't have that conversation with him, I might not have known. Yeah. 
And the thing is, what do you do when you discover that? Do you say, well, you got to go. I mean, I'm going to go, I'm going to go contact the, Tell you know, the, 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 the group of leaders and say, this one's got to get no, because you do that and it's going to damage the whole field. It's going to damage everything. The, the, they're too intertwined. So he says, just leave them there. Just let them grow. And there's going to come a time when the harvest comes and it's going to be pretty obvious. Well, now that, you know, Mary found this and I understand it becomes pretty obvious when it's harvest time. Some of the plants have got heads of wheat on the top and some of them don't. And he says, I'll take care of that. I'll send, he uses the word angels, but I will send these angels and they will first gather the weeds and bundle them together and toss them into the fire to, to be consumed. And then the other ones will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Now that speaks to a separation and that offends people. And that's one other point I want to make. I've told you several times through this study about a word, scandalon, right? Scandalon is the stumbling block. It is the thing that often causes people to stumble and fall away. Just like when he said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, that was a scandal on. And they said, yeah, we can't follow anymore. And this concept will be a stumbling block for people. But it says what it says. You can say, I don't think that happens, but it's, and this is not the only time in this group that he's going to say this. So, you know, brace for it. But it, he says that, that, as he does the explanation, I'm going to skip down to this real quick, uh, at the end of the age, and Mary said, when is that? Because at the end of the age, I'll send my angels, and they're going to separate these, and, and there will be a, a separation. And she says, when's the end of the age? I lived with that this week as we studied, because people talk about the age of uh, what the, church? Else? the church, the dispensationalism, they have all these, I mean, they have a calendar for what age we're in and everything. And I'm, again, I'm just not that confident to know. I know that the end of the age says there's going to be a time when this stuff is going to get put right. And I say fairly often, I sometimes think it's my job to set things right. And I have to remind myself that Jesus came and, and he, he gave us our marching orders. He made us a part of it. He, he atoned for us, but he didn't set the whole world right. He said, there's going to be a time I'm going to come back and this stuff is going to get straightened out. Yes. I mean, that's, that's what we read, but, but for right now, the weed and the weeds are going to grow together and, and your job is not to, to, to root them up. So there's, there's, you'd ask about my stance on the middle East. There's part of it, Mario, that's that, that you know, it's, it's not going to be our place to set this right. Uh, I, I do think, though, also keep in mind, I try and convince you that through this ministry, Jesus is teaching the people, but he's especially specifically preparing the 12 and others, but it's explicitly the 12 for their place after he's gone, after he dies and is resurrected and, and leaves it to them to spread the gospel. And so you think about what this message conveys. He has a special explanation to them. They're going to be going out, spreading this gospel, this good news that he has given them to, to carry. And they're going to see exactly this. They're going to see places where one of the, the leaders of the church says, I don't believe any of this. And what are you supposed to do about it? Well, you know, you're going to let them grow together. I'll take care of it, you know, down the road. But for right now, we're going to have both of these existing in the same place. Do you think that would be a good lesson to them in the role that they're going to play? I would think this would be handy information. So now you see the purpose in the teaching. Does it benefit other people? Sure it does. But never forget when he does these things that he's preparing them for, and by extension then, us who have inherited this job from them. This is good information for us. I'm going to go back now to Matthew 13, verse 31. 
and he had finished the parable of the weeds and his next one, he put before them another parable. <coughs> the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, a mustard seed that a man planted in his field. Although it is the smallest of all seeds, yet it grows into the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. So here's another fun one. We, as we study, we read a lot of commentaries, we watch sermons and stuff. And, and we actually heard somebody make an issue out of the fact that mustard seeds are not, in fact, the smallest seed. <laughs> so Jesus was wrong. I mean, seriously. We, and then they, then, the, then they corrected themselves, or then they said, but at that time. It... <laughs> oh, yeah, they slice and dice these things to the point. It is a, it is a very, very small, small seed. seed. <laughs> Got it. And the point is that from this tiny, small seed, this plant springs up and and it grows to the point and, and a mustard plant is like a crepe myrtle a crepe myrtle is a bush it's not a tree but you let it grow and it looks like a tree uh, okay you know people make a big deal out of the difference between dolphins and porpoises and i think i don't know they're those big things that <laughs> blow the air up and we know who, what you're talking about a, a mustard plant it is a big bush, but it turns into what looks like a tree. And they grow them, they harvest them. I learned a lot about mustard plants this week. <laughs> they grow them and harvest them here too. There are four different varieties. <laughs> anyway, so this small, this small seed that takes root, and remember, he's talked about seeds that fall on the, the, the rocky ground, and they fall on the, the hard pack pathway, and they fall in the good soil. This is right in the same area. We, th we see sort of the, the connection, but this seed that the 12 are going to be taking, his words, his gospel, his message, and it's going to grow, and, and it's going to turn into this, this tree, and the birds of the air are going to come and make, it's going to provide comfort and, and safety and shelter for people. There are people who take this one and they say, you know, in the Bible, birds are always evil. <laughs> okay, so what are you saying? You're saying that there's a seed that's going to get planted and, and evil things are going to live in it. And that, well, what, if that were true, what would that message be? What, what lesson would that teach us? Do, do, you, do you see a problem with that? Yeah. So uh, you probably aren't that interested, I mean, because you don't put up with all these people. But the point is, <laughs> the point is, this is a fairly simple teaching. And if you're going to be the 12 or any of these other people who wind up taking this gospel after everything comes to fruition, they take it and begin to plant those seeds, that you're going to see that from this very small beginning, it sprouts and it grows and it becomes this thing that people will take comfort and safety and shelter in that it, it's going it's a beautiful thing it has a purpose it's pretty simple teaching it's a parable verse 33 he told them still another parable the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and mixed into three measures of flour until all of it was leavened it's a one sentence parable it's a thing they all know that's what happens when you when you bake bread. You mix in a little bit of yeast, and it, it spreads through the entire dough. And everything is then is exposed, winds up being exposed to the leaven, to the yeast. And you see his teaching, the kingdom of heaven is like. So these seeds that you plant, this gospel that they're going to be taking, is going to be like yeast that gets mixed into flour and suddenly, you know, it permeates things. There are two parables in a row that seem to deal with the idea that this is going to grow. This is going to start with a few of you and it's going to grow into something very, very important. I don't see it being that tough. Did you know that in the Bible, leaven always means sin? Oh, this is what we put up with on these parables this week. And they go through, the, I mean, this whole thing. It's pretty clear what he's, what he's saying. And you put those two parables together, and you see this idea that the 12 are going to get 
that their place in things, they're going to begin the spread of the gospel, but then it's going to get carried out and carried out and carried out, and it's going to spread around the world. And that's a preparation I'm convinced once again for them, for the ones that are the, the, you know, the early adopters, they say, but these are the first people that are going to be coming and spreading the gospel. And he's teaching them, he's preparing them for what's going to happen. Is uh, he also teaching that you may be the carrier of the seed you know, the river, but it's really out of your hands. Well, there's it just, is from above and you're going to get all kinds of audiences. And it's going to grow. Really, whether you preach it every day or not, it's going to grow in and of itself. We certainly have a place in it. They certainly had a place to make it no spread. It that. is. It is without question, though. It's not our seed. You know, it's not yeah. our word. And 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 our place is to you know is to broadcast it. Uh, and we do have a place. And it's important to remember that we have a place. But it's not it's not ours. Yeah. And you were gonna that correct me if I'm wrong. So what's the issue with leavened bread? Because you're always told not to eat leavened bread. Well, okay. So so what what happened was when the, the what we know as Passover, when the, the Jews are being uh led out of Israel, out of captivity. Out of Egypt out of Egypt, they, this has happened very, very quickly. When it finally reached a point that Pharaoh said, okay, go, <laughs> they're going to have to leave like overnight. This is like somebody who hasn't paid the rent. They got to get out now, right? So what they were told is leavened bread, and we learned this living in Israel, that we have preservatives in a lot of stuff that we, that we eat. They don't put preservatives in their bread. And you go get brand new fresh bread at the market, and like a day and a half later, it's green. Leavened bread goes bad much quicker. So what they were told to do was to take the flour, take the you know, dough with no yeast in it. Prepare for this trip. You don't want any, you don't want any yeast in there. And so every year when they celebrate Passover, they actually have a time where they go through the house and get rid of anything that that has is leavened, anything that, and the kids, and they look for little specks. It's sort of a, of a ritual that they go through. But but that about leaven then was a very specific thing that they were to have, they're essentially making crackers, you know, it's flour and water and, and no yeast. And then they were told to commemorate that, to never forget that God delivered them from Egypt. And so part of that commemoration that they were really told was to make this bread like the bread that they made on the road, this unleavened bread. So, so it's not a sin thing of never eat bread that has leaven. That's a part of their remembrance. Jewish remembrance they were instructed to do. So the two things are not necessary, but they do know leaven. The, the Jews that he's talking to do understand that a little bit of yeast goes a long, long way because it spreads. Does that make sense? So wasn't it an issue when, when the Jews were in the desert and, and God kept, kept feeding them, that, not that they were making, kept feeding them manna, Yes. and then they got tired of manna, and they didn't want manna anymore. Uh, I'm just... I'm not trying to tell you that sin, uh, that, that leaven is sin, but to me, it, it may be erroneously connotated uh, contamination. It, it you know, does, it does in certain instances, and this is the thing with parables. Generally speaking, if you're not trying to turn them into allegories, when you read a parable, you got a pretty good idea what the lesson is about, even if it, if it hangs you up a little bit. So is there time, Jesus talks about the leaven of the Pharisees, and it has to do with what they've done with the law, with their corrupt nature, pardon me, nature, if you will, that it tends to spread within the body of, of the Jewish community like leaven does. It's a useful tool to explain people how things spread. So when he says the leaven of the Pharisees, 
to turn that into a general thing that says anytime there's yeast, it's sin, I think may be a little ambitious. Yeah. Um, verse 34, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowds in parables. He did not tell them anything without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. And that is from Psalm 78 too. Yeah, it's a it's the words of the words of David, and it's generally considered to be messianic, uh, as uh, you know that that he is actually prophesying about the Messiah. But I love the the idea that he's talking to them in parables, and he often says, "He who has ears, let him hear." You know, not everybody is going to understand the parable. Just just the way it is. It's another one of those things that offends some people, but it's the way it is. But I do love that he quotes that place from, from Psalm, from David, where he says that I will uh, reveal things, utter things hidden from the foundation of the world. I mean, he's say, telling some very deep concepts to people and the people who come seeking, the people that, that you know, their eyes are open, understand it, but not everyone does. Then um, <clears throat> I'd already read 36 that it started with, then Jesus dismissed the crowd, and then he explained the parable of the weeds. And then we're going to start with another parable. One of the things that always was a, a, a confused me the begin before was, it, you know, is the crowd there? Isn't the crowd there? But remember, Matthew doesn't necessarily write in chronological order. So, you know, what, what he says is that he did explain the parable of the, of the weeds just to the disciples. So these next three parables we're going to read, we don't know if it's in front of the big crowd or, or just the disciples. We don't know. I, I, I will right? say that, that it's also important to remember on the parable and they, they, don't understand it fully. And he explains it to them. Just because somebody hears the parable and doesn't understand it, often what happens with these kinds of teachings is that somewhere down the road, something comes to us and the light goes on. And we go, oh, wait a minute. That's what that is. And, and I believe that we get understanding at times when we need it. That, that, you know, when it becomes important, the fullness of time. But there's also the fact that I'm sure the 12 explained this to other people later on. They said, oh, yeah, you know, you remember this teaching? Well, he told us, let us tell you. And that comes back to our place in this, that we have a role, we have a place, and it may well be our place to explain a parable like this to someone that says, you know, I'm really struggling. There's a point later on, the Ethiopian man who's traveling, he's been to Jerusalem and he's going home and God sends Philip, go out and meet this guy. And he's reading from the scriptures. He's reading from Torah. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy says, not really. He says, how can I understand it if there's nobody to explain it to me? And Philip hops up on the chariot and says, well, let me tell you. It's funny you should mention that. That's sort of what I was sent here for. We do have that role, and, and we are often sent people. They come into our lives for a reason, and to shy away from that probably is missing an opportunity that we're put here for. So just because I say that people hear a parable and don't understand, it doesn't mean that they never understand, and it doesn't mean that it can't be our job to, to explain it to them. Verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he, when he found one, every, when he found one very precious pearl, he went away and sold all he had and bought it. So here are two, the kingdom of heaven is like. They're parables, and he's trying to get across a concept. And so there are a lot of elements to understanding what this kingdom of heaven is. And here's one where he describes two different situations where somebody sees this treasure 
and sells everything for let's go of everything else to attain it. There's one line in here that hangs people up. The theologians just, just beat it to death. I'll get back to it. But you see in both of those, somebody who sees this treasure that the kingdom of heaven is like, and it is so precious, it is so important that they set aside everything else in order to attain it. One of the things we should get from this is neither of those two people would be able to attain or to acquire this treasure without putting other things aside. They literally have to go mortgage the house, you know, if that's what it takes. And, and this teaching here is about the fact, and if you think about the 12, they're going to have to give up everything. They do, in fact, give up everything. Uh, I, John's the only one that lives to a ripe old age. The other ones get, get you know, killed over it. So, so that's what he's saying, that this, the kingdom of heaven that I keep telling you about, when you see it, when you really recognize it, is something that is so important that people will lay aside. They will give up all of these other things that have been in their lives to be a part of it. There's one line in there where the guy sees the treasure in the field that says he hid it again. And, and that one thing, you know, well, that seems dishonest. And that seems like you're mis misleading. And okay, probably Jesus was teaching you that in order to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, you have to be misleading and dishonest. I think that was probably what he was getting at. It, it's part of a parable. They certainly would, would understand in fact, you find out part of their culture, people like winning the lotto, they have this dream of being out acquiring land and finding copper or finding salt or finding something of value that suddenly they're rich. Mm -hmm. And the idea that if you find it, I don't know why that's thrown in. I'm going to be real honest a bit about hide it again. I mean, I've been over it and over it. But if you, if you went in to buy the field and you knew and, and you they could see it i don't think that's part of the teaching it's disturbing i wouldn't let it hang you up because you see the purpose of these two that the kingdom of heaven is going to be something that people will see as being so precious and they set aside other things in their life to be part of it See, what I thought they were going to say is that he, he gave up everything about the field, but he forgot what he hit it at. He forgot what he hit it at. Well, that sometimes happens. That's, you know, maybe we should put an addendum on here. It does sometimes, it does sometimes happen. But if we put that in context, it's not the pearl itself until you see it and believe it. Then, then you voluntarily will get everything left. You do see in these two examples, one person who just sort of stumbles onto the treasure. He's out in the field and stumbles onto it. Maybe some rain, whatever. It but not have but been his field. He, it, just a work. Well, he had to buy it. So clearly it wasn't. He just, he's, he's going through. And there it is. And that is the way some people come on to the kingdom of heaven. And then the next guy is a merchant who's out looking for pearls. He's looking for something. He's seeking something, right? Well, we know those people, yeah. and it's a very obvious thing. They're out looking for something of value in this world, and suddenly they come upon this kingdom of heaven, and they go, oh my gosh, this is what I've been looking for. So you see two examples in here of people that, that come to this same place, but in both cases, it's precious, it's precious to them, and, and you do wind up setting aside other things that are no longer important to you. Verse 47, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was cast into the sea and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the men pulled it ashore. Then they sat down and sorted the good fish into containers, but threw the bad away. So will it be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understanding of all these things? Yes, they answered. I'm going to stop there. Okay. So this is the one parable out of this group 
it's, it doesn't get a lot of argument. It's kind of hard to get around what this one is saying. And if the kingdom of heaven is like a net, well, there are a bunch of those people. This is the Galilee. This, this, there are people who fish. And even if they don't, they see this happen. They're trash fish and they're fish that you keep and sell that, that you drop the net, it fills up a fish, and then you bring it in and you sort them out. And the good fish go into containers and the bad fish just get tossed away. And this once again speaks of that separation. Now, as I said, this one doesn't seem to get all the argument. What I found disturbing studying and reading commentaries about this parable is the number of people who seem to take great pleasure in the idea that some are gonna get some are gonna get cast out. And you they just have these big grins. I mean, it's almost like, yeah, and they're gonna get what they have coming. And I'm thinking the one thing that I have learned to avoid is hoping that people get what they have coming because I don't want to get what I have coming. And they seem to take, they get these big sharp grins, you know, when they talk about how it's the net and the bad fish are going to get tossed. The good fish are going to, well, that's what it says. For starters, there's not much discussion about whether or not that's what it says. If it, if it offends you, that's a different, that's a different issue. But he says that, that, um, He's the, well, let me see if I better, I want, to, I want to get it right. At the end of the age, again, at the end of the age. So just like, just like uh, the fishermen who, who call through the, 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 the good ones and the bad ones, at the end of the age, the angels will come, and this sounds just like the other parable, right. and will separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I realized I missed an opportunity back when he's telling this same thing back at the other, the parable of the weeds and, and the wheat. And if you don't mind me skipping back for just a minute, um, the parable of the weeds, he says at the end of the age, and all of a sudden, I'm, oh, well, that's when he's explaining, it, yeah. he's explaining it to them that, that, uh, I'm going to go back to verse 40, 40 41. The, at the end of the age, the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom every cause of sin. And there's loads of speculation about what that is. And some people say, well, that means that even after people die, he's going to weed out of the hearts the causes of sin. Ugh. Do you remember... Three times now, I've told you about a word, scandalon, the stumbling block. Well, if you read the original, it says he will weed out of the kingdom every scandalon, every stumbling block, everything that causes people to trip and fall, to fall away. The snare, the fact the scandalon, if there's a snare and there's a stick that holds it up, the, the, that's baited, so when the animal touches the stick, the snare falls on him. He will weed out of his kingdom every scandalon, everything that gets in the way that causes people to fall away. So it's a, it's a concept that comes up over and over and over again about the stumbling block, about the things that get in our way that cause us to say, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't follow that. That's a hard teaching. So, so this idea that he says that he's going to separate the fish, and at the end of the age, the, the angels will come, and they will separate out. This is going to get taken care of. I don't know any way to, to say this other than <clears throat> Jesus talks about a separation at the end of the age. And I know people who, who believe, how do you like me now? <laughs> who I said I was going to say that this week, who believe that it's like it's like the that old Disney thing, all dogs go to heaven, right? That that certainly God would not cause this separation, that it eventually everybody figures it out. It just after they die, they get it, they get a chance. That that um there's a some people believe in a place called purgatory, where after we die. We go there where we're purged of all of these sins that we've amassed, okay? Suppose for a minute 
that that's true. Suppose for a minute that, that somewhere, even though I can't find it, it's revealed that, that this is the way. If that were the case, if I could go and, and ask God to explain to me or someone exactly how this works, and you determine that, that it doesn't matter what I do, all dogs go to heaven. What would you do with that information if you had it? Would you say, well, I guess I don't need to worry about anything because it's, it's a, so what's a little extra time in purgatory for me or somebody else? Or what if someone is sent into your life and you realize I should probably tell them something about this gospel, about my faith, but you think, well, you know, it's, they're going to come out in the same place the same way. It may just take a little longer. I think I'm going to keep my mouth shut because that's taking a risk. They might not like me or they might be offended or maybe I just, you know, I don't want them going through my life and saying, well, you, so, so if that's true, how would you behave? What's that? Absolutely. I mean, what the heck? I, I just feel like, I feel like if, if it means I've got to spend a little extra time in purgatory, it might be worth it because it all comes out the same. Part of me would like to say, I hope you're right, that I hope that's the way it works out. I know what this says. I mean, this, I'm afraid, is pretty, is, is hard to get around the fact that he says there's going to be a separation at the end of the age. Everything's going to get sorted out, and I'm going to, I'm going to remove all of the, the things that cause people to, to stumble. We're going to weed out the, the wheat from the, the weeds, and the others will shine like the sun in the kingdom of heaven. That's what the parables say, boys and girls. There's no way around it. So if it's a scandal on for you, I can't help that. If it's a stumbling block, but that's what it says. So, and it's interesting at the end on, on verse um, 51, it says, have you understood all these things? Yes, they answered. This is a rabbi teaching. And he goes through this teaching and he, and he explains these, he tells them these parables and he says, do, do you understand all this? And they go, yeah. And I think there's always a good, I, I read this every time I've ever seen it. I've thought, yeah, I bet you do. But you, <laughs> you get the concept at least. You got that much. We tend to learn things over time. It becomes more real. It becomes bigger in our lives. But he says, Have you, do you understand what I'm getting at here? Have you heard this teaching? And they say, yes, we do. We get it. He says, therefore, every scribe, then he told them, I haven't read this yet. For this reason, every scribe who has discipled in the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. So what's a scribe? The scribes are the people who write down, but they are literally the teachers and the keepers of the law. They are rigid law keepers. And they call them scribes because they do also write it down. Yes. He's just told them that these things about the kingdom of heaven. And he says, okay, if you understand all that, then you need to understand that for the reasons we just covered, the kingdom of heaven, the understanding, the separate, for all of that, every scribe who's discipled in the kingdom of heaven, to be discipled, strangely, the word is methetes. That comes from the same root as math mathematics. It is, I keep telling you that to be a disciple is to accept the teachings, to learn the teachings. You can be a believer without understanding everything, but to be a disciple, you need to be dedicated to learning the teachings. You can't be a disciple without knowing the teachings. So every scribe who is discipled, who is taught and, and, and has accepted to become a disciple, a scribe, so it tells us, first of all, that just because they're scribes, just because they're law keepers, it doesn't mean that <clears throat> some of them are not going to hear the gospel and become disciples. And a scribe, someone who is a teacher of the law, is going to become like a homeowner that reaches into his storeroom and pulls out new things as well as old. The law doesn't go away. 
they don't quit becoming scribes. They don't quit become. They don't quit being students of the law. But this other teaching that I'm giving you, this other teaching, teaching that I'm giving them, sort of floats on top of it. Remember the new wineskins and the old wineskins. You have to be flexible enough to take in new things to grow with that. There, even a scribe who's a rigid lawkeeper. Some of them are going to hear this and become new wineskins, and, and they're going to bring out of their storehouse all the old stuff as well as new stuff. What's wrong with the law? What's, what's the flaw in the law? It can be, can be upheld. I mean, human, human You know, you're right. You're right. And I don't want to be somebody who says, ah, oh, no, that's not what I'm looking for. I mean, you're correct. It can't be upheld. But the fact is there's nothing wrong with the law. The place where he says, you've heard it said, thou shalt not kill, but I tell you, if you've thought in your heart about it, you're just as guilty. There's the difference. The law is about doing. His teaching, the gospel is about being. It's about the heart. It's about who we are and who we become. And so a scribe can still carry around all this stuff about the law. And it's not bad. Thou shalt not kill, really? I mean, that's, but what Jesus says is that was only the beginning. That was, that was to bring us to the point that you will, you will understand the rest of this. It points out our sinfulness and the fact that we need, we need this atonement. We need what he brings, but it's an interesting thing that he covers at the end. Does this remind you when I keep telling you that he's preparing the 12? Because the tendency would be to say, these people who are all rigid and part of the law, we don't even need to bother with them, right? I mean, they're, they're gone. They're, they're, they're stuck in their ways. They never hear us. We're going to ignore them. And he's just told them at the end of this big, long teaching that the scribes who hear and become disciples are still going to, are still going to talk about the law. But with that, they're going to bring out of their storehouse of knowledge these new things. The kingdom of heaven is here and it's for you. And it's the same message. It's the same message over and over again. But Scott, I think he's also saying <clears throat> it's one book, Old Testament, New Testament, the prophets. I came to fulfill. The law I came to fulfill. So guys, learn your history. All those guys have a shot at it. We saw a lot of stuff in food. It failed. So I'm coming. I'm here. And it's for you too, not just for the Jews. So come on here and think and believe. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't commit it. Keep up with those things. You know, it's, it's a good, that's a good place. But also the good Samaritan says that, that when you come across that person on the side of the road, or, or the other one where he talks about, is it legal to heal on the Sabbath? It's, it is legal to do good on the Sabbath. We've got to go beyond the law. So don't, you don't throw away the law. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not defective. It's what we do with it. And the fact that, that humans tend to use that as an excuse to say, well, I've, kept, I've, I've done those things. I'm good. That's what he's teaching. It's past and it's time. It's past so, so next week we'll finish the, the last paragraph or two of verse 13 of chapter 13, and then we'll go into the fourth section of, of Matthew. Are you going to talk about the book? Oh, um, yeah, real, real quick. quick. Um, what we're thinking of um, after Matthew is um, actually to. Um, study a book that is, let me see if I can do, yeah, How We Got the Bible by um, Neil Lightfoot. And it, um, we've done this study years ago. This book um, was first written in 1963, and then it has two more editions all the way back to 2003. This, this gentleman who's now passed away spent 40 years of his life doing this book. And, um, and the purpose of this book is not to debunk the Bible at all. This purpose of this book is to give you the assurance. Well, his wasn't to necessarily affirm it either. He went out on a, a thing because we asked how, how dependable 
are these scriptures that we use? How authoritative? I mean, can we really rely on that? And what's surprising is that, you know, after going through it and understanding, it's, and, and if you object, if, if a lot of you object to the idea of not teaching directly from the Bible, we watch it. this is about, we won't, we'll, we'll move, we'll find something else. But this is, I think, a really important piece in, in your, your faith of understanding, once you really see how we got these scriptures, it's kind of amazing stuff. So we're thinking about it. You can send us email if you want to. God, we are amazed. We, we continue to be amazed that you find us important enough to spend time on. Sometimes that gets in the way because we think, why? But we see in these words that were left in these accounts of the stories, the parables that you told, you see this amazing plan that you've made for us, this chance that we have for a life more abundant. And we're thankful for it. We are amazed at it. If I could ask one thing today is that some of us would find in studying this, in seeing these, the importance that we have, the place that you've made for us to be a part of this, and to be less timid about sharing it, uh, about explaining it, about being there for, for others who need it. As always, be with us this week. Give us the eyes to see those that you put in our path. Give us the heart to be able to watch the news and what's going on in the Middle East and not lose hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can unmute yourself. And like I said, I'll send out an email. But remember, next week, anybody who's in town, we will go to Lisa and John Paul's house right afterwards and do communion and bless our new home. So there we go. There you go. You guys have a wonderful week. Bye. Bye. One for your uh, leader. Who, uh,